from Bathurst to Transylvania. I found the advertisement in the Toronto Sun Entertainment section. <laughs> Nosferatu set to the music of Radiohead one night only, Sunday, 8 p.m., 3405 Bathurst Street. I was there all right, but I sure as hell didn't see a cinema. What I did see was a row of brown, 70s looking townhouses. One was completely boarded up, the rest took drab to another level, with wooden shingles doubling as the siding and roofing. I got out of the car and crossed the street to investigate. As I walked closer, I could see a podium on one of the porches, 3405 Bathurst. I climbed the stairs and felt vibrations under my feet. I looked around. An empty flower pot sat in a corner, a sun painted on its side. On the opposite end was a broom, flat on the ground, bristles looking like they were hacked at with a knife. Only thing else was the podium, and it was a simple one, made out of wood and weathered. My shoes were still shaking from the reverberations, the source unknown. I drew in my breath and knocked, and I knocked, and I knocked again. While I was debating whether to leave or not, the door opened and a boy, maybe 16, poked his head out. What's up? You here for the movie? Yeah. He opened the door a couple more inches and slithered out, forcing me to take two steps back. He closed the door and moved behind the podium. He was wearing gym shorts, no shoes, and an unbuttoned plaid shirt showing off his hairless chest. He flipped his head to the side to remove the blondish mop of hair from his eyes. Five bucks. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> I'm gonna invite you to my stand-up comedian routine. Right. I handed him the money and he pulled a stamp and ink pad from inside the podium. I offered my fist and he marked me. You here for vampires or Radiohead? <laughs> Both. Cool, you can go inside. It'll start in a few minutes. I nodded my head and reached the door. Like all the other homes in Toronto, this one was narrow. The brown walls certainly didn't help correct that illusion either. There was a staircase leading up and a hallway leading to the back. To my left, a wall covered in photos of classic celebrities. To my right were closed French doors. The source vibrations that I could clearly now hear. Pink Floyd. Specifically, Time by Pink Floyd. I was still only a foot inside when the stamp boy reached in from the podium and closed the door, shutting out the evening light and flooding the room in darkness. David Gilmore's muffled voice was all I was left with. Down the narrow hall, a door opened and a light appeared. A short, pudgy figure waddled towards me. The floorboards creaked with every step. Hey, hey, how are you doing? I squinted my eyes until he was sitting in front of me, shaking my hand. He had a god-awful comb-over and glasses that, combined with his nose, looked like an empty seesaw. He was wearing, he was wearing a white Peter undershirt, deflated football breasts bulging, khaki shorts, and black socks pulled up to his calves. Name's Danny. Come on in. Let me get you a beer. Nah, that, that's okay. Come on. I don't drink. I'm not charging you. He pulled me by the elbow and I was fully sucked in now. The room at the end of the hallway was the kitchen. Depending on how you looked at it, it was either a disaster or a quarter's daydream. A small four-person table was flush against the wall, piled with books, magazines, mail, you name it. Opposite that was the sink and countertop. Food cans, bottles, bags of chips, dirty dishes, glasses, towels, there was shit everywhere. He pointed to a chair at the table and opened the fridge and pulled out two Heinekens. Danny was talking faster than I could comprehend. Opening them, he handed one to me and kept on yapping like a toy dog staring at its reflection. Any minute, I was expecting Bruce Campbell, chainsaw arm and all, to enter and save me. Danny must have sensed something from my anxious glances, because he went and closed the door, cutting down the noise from behind the French doors I saw earlier. Dark side and Wizard of Oz, he said, motioning with his head. It'll be over in like five minutes. You here for vampires or Radiohead? Both. <laughs> Very nice. He walked towards me until he was beside the table. He took a swig of his beer and placed it down. 
With one palm flat on the table, he used the other to straighten the seesaw across the bridge of his nose. He leaned forward, his head slightly turned up, beady eyes looking down. I could see crinkly black and gray nose hairs poking out of his nostrils, waving like ribbons tied to a fan with each wheeze. I think I saw one dislodge. I stayed focused on his stubble, afraid if I looked down, I'd see the nose hair land directly inside the neck of the Heineken. Where are you from? he whispered. I swallowed hard and licked my lips. North Carolina? I whispered back. Do you know how to kill a vampire? <laughs> Garlic? <laughs> you drive a stake through their motherfucking heart! He screamed, <laughs> fist clenched being a table. Right through the motherfucking heart! <laughs> I lifted my arms and beer into the air and leaned back, away from the table, as Danny continued his assault. If Bruce Campbell didn't get here soon, I'd be in serious trouble. But as quickly as Danny transformed into a lunatic, calmness returned, and he stood up straight and fixed his glasses. Everything was quiet. Ah, movie's over. Give me five minutes. He picked up his overturned beer and took a gulp. He left the kitchen, leaving the door open. I was in some sort of experiment which I hadn't yet formed a hypothesis for. I kept my arms raised in the air, my Heineken saluting a photo of Bing Crosby on the wall. Hearing footsteps above my head, I realized someone was coming down the stairs. I twisted my body around so I could look the demon in the eye before it dragged me to hell. It was another teenager. <laughs> a shirtless Indian wearing only a pair of gym shorts and a beaded necklace to maintain modesty over his wiry body. He moved past me briskly, not even turning his head, and grabbed a Heineken from the fridge before retreating upstairs. My arms remained in the air. Human voices could be heard, and I saw five or six people exit from the French doors and continue out the front. So I wasn't going to die. I placed my beer on the table and stood up to venture into the screening room. Sardis Theater was two adjoining rooms, probably the living and dining room of a previous life. Against the front wall was a large white sheet nailed in place. Beside the sheet, on both sides, were two large speakers sitting in chairs facing the seating area, comprised of about 12 to 14 rows, six or eight chairs in each. The chairs were a hodgepodge of lawn chairs, folding chairs, bridge chairs, desk chairs, whatever had four legs in a seat. At the midpoint of the double room were two more stand-up speakers, one on each side. There were two windows, both blacked out. I picked a seat towards the back right and made my way over. I sat there alone for maybe two minutes, before a giggling couple entered the room, hand in hand. They looked at me, still with some more laughter, and sat in the third row and began to make out. I looked at my watch, it was two minutes past eight. A twenty-something walked in, wearing jeans, a pullover, sprung a backpack. He looked around the room and whistled. It sounded like he was impressed. His head quickly snapped to my area of the room, and I instantly looked into my lap. I could hear the friction of his jeans as he began walking down the side aisle. Out of my periphery, I saw his figure stop at the head of my row. Jesus Christ. The figure became larger and larger until it stopped beside me. He dropped his bag on the ground, and I could hear the clink of bottles inside it. He sat down next to me and bent over, unzipped his bag. Want a beer? he asked in a British accent. No thanks, I answered, turning my head to make eye contact. Fucking weird place, right? Almost didn't find it. You here for the vampires or Radiohead? Both. Right on. He popped the top off and sucked on his beer for a solid five seconds. I love vampires, but I fucking love Radiohead, he continued, <laughs> wiping his mouth with his sleeve. I bit my lip and politely nodded, my head facing the screen, but my eyes focused on the blacked out windows. What would you do if you, were alone, if you were alone in a room with them? He asked. I sighed loudly. Radiohead or vampires? Radiohead. <laughs> Don't know. You know what I do? What? I said, turned to face him. He leaned forward. I could smell the beer on his breath. 
I'd lick their faces. <laughs> a buzz hit the air and the lights vanished. His face, inches from mine, submerged into the darkness. The projector sputtered on and Johnny Greenwood's fuzzy guitar came to life. I jerked my head back toward the sheet acting as a screen and dared not move nor breathe. With Danny's words in my head and warm beer breath on my cheek, I fondled the chair on my other side, hoping it had wooden legs to serve as a stake, just in case Bruce Campbell never showed up. Thank you.